play against. Rami with the Overlord Starfong, a lot better versus Border Gresh if he's anticipating a lot of token druid and things of the sort. Mutinous, if you're going up against more of those priests and the, the warlock lineups. But we'll see what ends up happening. Game room one's upon us. This is semifinal number one on the final day of Hearthstone Grand Masters Americas. Go ahead and hop on into it. So with Fled being going first and already having a curve, it looks pretty good, but you know, there's always this opportunity for the Rush Warrior dynamic to also slow down. In the mirror, sometimes as much as it's about getting ahead and snowballing that advantage, we've seen some people make some big comebacks, TJ, with those power-loaded stats of hand buffing and trying to fight for later into the game. And I feel like cards like Overlord Starfong even help lean into that a little bit. So even though I think a lot of people would be like, oh, Flat has a one and he's going first, he should be at a pretty good advantage. Uh, I'm waiting to see what Robbie can do to fight back in the middle of the party game. Yeah, being on the coin in this matchup while you do fall behind in tempo allows you that extra mulligan slot. And um, oddly enough, like some of the most important cards in this matchup are it's like conditioning, right? Because uh, that's what you want. You want those big board swings. You want to just be able to out muscle your opponent in the mid game. So having Ringmaster Watley in conditioning, I think, is much better than what what uh, Flood's going to be doing in this, this early game. Obviously, he's going to have tempo, but it's not really about that. Unless you're sticking a ton of damage and Rami has almost nothing, uh, it's I, I, I favor Rami in, in this situation. All right, well, Flood already has as early as a turn three Tent Trasher, a really powerful 5-5 five, five rusher that can get out to the board quickly, add that stat count, and start snowballing, and also just, you know, really amplify the amount of power to pressure your opponent's life total. However, there is also the Wormall Challenger, which is very clean to get onto the board and take down that bumper car with minimal damage loss at the moment. So there is that choice, and part of what makes... Um, cards like 10 trash are a little better is the ability to trade over something immediately so saving that 10 trasher for the following turn to say take down sword eater or something else it's a very clean trade it seems preferable so flood's gonna lead with that and rami has to now respond to a board that's quickly getting uh, a little bit intimidating, especially if uh, cards like Rokara come down soon, TJ. It, gets, <laughs> it can start to get really nasty. Yeah, that's why, you know, it's kind of a fine balance. If Rami knows that the longer this game goes on, the more favored he is. But at the same time, he needs to make sure that he's not taking too much damage uh, before he gets to this point where he's just going to be putting an overwhelming amount of stats on the board. It's also a fine balance for Flood because he doesn't want to overextend onto the board, right? That's why the Warmall Challenger, while it's less power in play, uh, it does mean that uh, Flood can use this Tent Trasher to trade up, uh, get more value out of it, instead of letting Rami dictate uh, how this Tent Trasher is going to die um, when, you know, Rami would, or Flood would just be trading it over a, a 1 2, right? What? So no. it's, it's all, all about a, a, uh, finding a balance for both the aggressor uh, and I, I guess <laughs> the control player, which feels weird to call it that since they play that until like turn five and then they play conditioning and then boom, they're the aggressor. It flips. Wow. I mean, Rami has accepted his role so much as a defender versus the beatdown that he is essentially just passing on turn three. Because he's trying to go for the inevitable power swing turns with conditioning in the Dark Moon Riders that you were talking about. Does have the... Oh, wow. Two parade leaders. Barry wonders if he just wants to completely go all in on this game plan and play Ring Ringmaster Watley, just draw cards. I think he actually would be overdrawn at that point. I have to count. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, no. nine, uh, nine, ten cards he would have in his hand. Oh, he dump a rider in that case, uh, which isn't the worst thing in the world. I think he'd be okay at nine, right? Because I forgot that the coin and rot league cost two cards. So you draw three, so you just end up being plus one. I wonder. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Think that would be the case. Either way, <laughs> if Rami wants to go for this all-in plan on the big conditioning. 
uh, reversal, you know, just try to go for a big tempo swing and answer it. He's got tools to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare to be Yeah, I would have to end up dumping, as you were saying, TJ. Does he even dump, though? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean... Oh, okay, never mind. That next card's conditioning, he's going to be a little bit sad, but he already has one, so... Playing for the most tempo possible going into the next turn, holding on to the Athletic Studies discount, burning a card. I mean, th so this matchup never goes to fatigue, right? There, it, well, it's very rare that it goes to fatigue, unless both players are drawing exactly the same resources on exactly the same turns, and they're just smacking their minions into each other. Yeah. Um, so whatever card is discarded, you can just imagine that was the last card in Rami's deck, and he would have never seen it anyway. So it really doesn't matter. Oh, there's not many burns that would elicit that kind of reaction, but that is one of them. Overlord Rontok is a fantastic way to follow up his hand, given how much card draw. But as you mentioned, TJ, if the equivalent was putting Overlord Rontok on the bottom of your deck, then he wouldn't be missing out on much. Yeah, because the matchup rarely goes to fatigue. And so, just, uh, you know, excellent recognition from Rami. I like this line a lot. Capitalizing on the fact that Fled is dedicated to the curve. So even if, you know, Fled was taking a turn to set up a hand buff, he's going to be struggling a little bit. Not to mention, just look at his empty turn six. He's got seven, eight, nine. And this playmaker is very weak in this position. And so... You know, Rami taking the, the time to recognize like his hand could end up going for a decisive uh, tempo swing and then consecutively chain power turns after it is paying off handsomely here. What now? Certainly is. And uh, this is probably the turn that Fled had the least amount of flexibility on like having a dead turn, right? The turn after conditioning, the turn after or two turns after Rami has drawn so many powerful cards uh, with the Ringmaster Watley. This is like the ultimate opportunity for Rami to go for a big punish. It's just a playmaker on board. That is a, a pitiful play, honestly, for Blood. Not that he had a choice. It's just how it yeah. pans out sometimes. The caveat is Rami buffing a big minion like his troublemaker Alex Straza could be the victim of mutinous. And so in some ways, Rami should be careful about how much he extends with his smaller minions. Now, when you, when you see Fled start off with an aggressive curve like that, have two very middle of the road, like, you know, ba ba bad turns <laughs> in terms of like how powerful they could be. The playmaker is not a great play on turn six. Sets up a really interesting dynamic of, you know, what you can anticipate your hand, your opponent's hand to be like. This is also the other side of the equation. Sure, you could play Mutinous, and if it lands on Alex Straza, whatever. I have 8 plus 9, 17, 20 damage lined up. Yep. Honestly, it doesn't matter what the Mutinous lands on in this case. Well, the biggest thing is it's just a huge minion. But I mean, this is a lethal setup. Rami could just go face with everything. And if a troublemaker lands on the on Fled's hero portrait, he's dead. Yep. Uh, however, if it doesn't, then Fled has a very low <laughs> a very low out for lethal himself, Which right? No. Uh, it's true. Because <laughs> he'd, be he'd be hitting for 14. He's going to swing with this weapon this turn. Uh, and then uh, he could play his own troublemaker. And maybe, like, <laughs> split the uprights, and then boom, it's both go to the face. Uh, uh, yeah, this goes face every time. Oh, wow, okay. Oh. Fascinating. Ooh, I mean, oh, the ETC rushers, though, though uh, okay. give him that guarantee, right? Because now he gets to make the multiple copies. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, well done. And uh, Rami is going to close it out in very quick, successive fashion. Uh, I mean, Fled just really didn't have much he could be doing. And well, at that stage of the Rush Warrior matchup, it just comes down to whether or not you are ahead at a certain point, and then the race really starts. If you think about mid-range Hunter, right? 
and how those yeah. mirrors used to transpire. The moment someone was able to stick a very powerful minion like, you know, Savannah Hyman, end up leveraging that damage and just basically start pushing aggressively. That's kind of what happened here. Once Rami recognized that he was far ahead, even if Fled was at 23 life, he could set up this lethal chain push and had it covered in a couple of different ways. Uh, the ETC, of course, uh, was that guarantee for Rami. Um, and, of, and recognize that he didn't need to gamble on the Troublemaker, so that was our mistake. But going into game number two, now that the Rush Warrior Mirror has uh, gone, I'm pretty sure Rush Warrior is going to win no matter what, which is why starting it off in the series makes a lot of sense. This is probably the best uh, positioned deck for Rami's lineup and even on Flood's side. Now we go into the other decks, which feels like they've been a little bit less powerful than the Rush Warrior this weekend. Yeah, it really does. I think Rush Warrior... Um... Uh, even though it hasn't got that many more tools, I feel like uh, the tools that it did get kind of filled a lot of the weaknesses of, of the deck um, and uh, at least a lot of the flexibility to shore up some of its 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 poorer matchups. While again, not sacrificing much in the matchups that it was already good against, like Miracle Rogue, for instance. Um, Spell Mage, I don't think much has really changed. I do think that Rush Warrior is a slight favorite against Spell Mage, it, just because recurring weapon damage, right? Uh, if you can start off with Imprisoned Gnar, Sword Eaters, at some point, before they kill you, you're going to be able to piece together like a Troublemaker, Troublemaker, Alexstrasza, ETC, Lethal. They just have no ways to defend themselves if you're just playing on curve. Uh, Flood is going to switch up to the Weapon Rogue, though, which is an even worse matchup for Rami. Weapon Rogue versus Mage is one of Mage's uh, absolutely worst matchups. You have to have Encanter's Flow, Double Encanter's Flow. You have to get double ring tosses or discovered ice barriers. You have to play Deck of Lunacy and then like get the Libra of Hope off the top uh, uh, or on six at least, right, with the Encanter's Flow played in order to even have a chance. This one is uh, quite brutal. Yeah, very much so. I mean, when Weapon Rogue gets things rolling, it feels like one of the hardest decks to stop if you don't have Weapon Destruction, uh, largely because there's nothing to really interact with their board, and they don't really plan on interacting with your board unless you have taunts. So, uh, it, it, and Mage is really struggling to get minion pressure on the board. That being said, we also have seen some Weapon Rogues just not draw their weapons. Watch so. Uh, yep. That is the greatest weakness of Weapon Rogue, in my opinion, which is getting things like the oh. Shank. Look at oh. that opening hand from Rami as well. I mean, when you talk about unstoppable hands, this could lead to one of them. You can see Rami dancing. He's got Deck of Lunacy and the, uh, I mean, the Pegasus Bite as well. And a Deck of Lunacy could be super relevant to you, Jake. This, that's two nearly perfect hands in two games for Rami. I'm, I'm not surprised he's feeling it right now because that is, that's insane. That's an insane start. And he has every, like, powerful card for every matchup right now. Like, the only card he's missing is, like, Refreshing Spring Water. The question is, is how do you sequence it? Honestly, I think this is... Just primordial studies this turn, and Cantor's flow next turn, then coin deck of lunacy, uh, because the Librum of Hopes are massive in the matchup. It's true. The only yeah, problem with that is the, hope. then the two one is is uh, attacking you for multiple turns. So maybe he wants to Cantor's flow this turn, then ping next turn to get rid of right. the two one, and it delays the deck of lunacy by a turn, but it it saves him four four points of of health in the long term. I think the double and canister flow still works out pretty well. It just means that from Rami's perspective, he's not necessarily going to go to the line. As you can see, Flat already is like, all right, well played, well played. Uh, I, so you're right, TJ. I think that there's a lot to consider with like what kind of mana slot you want to use your Deco Lunacy on. This almost makes me feel like Rami isn't going to rely upon it, unless that's like the only play he has on turn four. But even then, you still get some pretty good stuff at 8. I'm thinking like Deep Freeze oh my actually God. is a low-key, really good thing you could play uh, a game for. Wow, a Pegasus Blast for 3 mana right on curve. That's, dis that's disgusting. Oh, it's so Holy bad. moly. Paralytic Poison gives us the ability to trade into the Thier Conjurer, or even just 
coerce and move on. I think man crick here makes a lot of sense from Flood's perspective to just try and get as much aggression down. This could be a situation where it's just a pure race. Who could get ahead of whom first? Yeah, I like the damage push because uh, coerce very tough card to use. Oh, yeah. And he's got, you know, two Wicked Stabs. He might not need the Swine Tusk Shank whatsoever. He might not need any other weapon, really, outside of the the dagger of the Rogue's Hero Power. That Prison Phoenix is very scary, though. It almost kind of goes back to what we were saying, that Rami's choice of double and flow almost feels like Deca Lunacy is not going to be the play unless he's kind of desperate for something. You know, like, let's say he needs to find some kind of healing, steal a deck of Lunacy, and then draw cards. More of these. Mm, wow, this is actually not uh, an easy choice here because his hand is looking quite weak on the card draw, so Blood Mage Thanos makes sense. It's also an argument that, you know, Steward of Scrolls gives him playable stuff. Oh, Fled finds preparation, so Secret Passage can now look for a weapon. He needs to find ways to really activate his hand. Sinister Strike's a good card to just dump. Yikes. Almost silverleaf poison. Uh, that's brutal. That is rough. I wonder if Fled should just cut in class for five here instead of attach silverleaf poison to the dagger. It's not the worst play to use silverleaf poison just to cycle for two draws over two turns with the rogue mm. dagger. But, you know, I'm thinking about Fled's ultimate game plan of just finding the repetitive damage through the weapon. And while cutting class for five is not great, at least you get to still play the Sinister Strike. If you dagger up in Silverleaf Poison, you can also get the same effects. Okay, so in his mind, Flood's like, I just gotta get my card draw going. So this is drawing four cards over two turns. And he finds a Swine Tushank. Can't help but wonder too. Yeah, I think your strike damage is going to matter. Yeah, at at this point, I think he just needed to draw cards as, as aggressively as possible. The problem with the uh, cutting class and sinister strike play is that he doesn't actually kill the three three on the board, uh, which is a pretty big deal because then he'd have to kill it the next turn. That's true. Um, That's true. And his his goal is to get a weapon and those draws and then start buffing it up. <sighs> That's a good uh, point for sure. On secret, ice barrier. I mean, this is everything that I said needed to happen for for Rami to be able to win. It's just he's not finding the card draw to uh, to back everything up. Well, I mean, Fled has the Swine Tush Shank and stabs and the Sinister Strike. I mean, two wicked stabs. Uh, Fled equipping the weapon. I think he's debating how he wants to deal with things. If he wants to remove the Imprisoned Phoenix with, say, the Wicked Stab. Or he could, say, play Cloak of Shadows. That's a little bit early for something like that. You often want to play Cloak of Shadows when you know your opponent's trying to target you with game-ending direct damage spells like Fireball. Arcane Intellect off the top of Rami, that's big. Refreshing spring water. water. This is the point where Flight gets very uncomfortable. Just seeing chain draws. Another refreshing spring water. I'm trying to spend his mana before he commits to refreshing spring water since he could get some of those mana crystals refunded. Fortunately, he finds really expensive minions relative to how much he wants to be able to dedicate towards these. So a little bit uncomfortable, but at least one of them draws cards. Sage, for example, draws cards for each what secret that's been played. What to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh gosh, Rune Orb. The question is whether or not Rami wants to unload the Mask of Cthulhu right oh, now, uh, just because Mask of Cthulhu is the only burn damage that can go through uh, uh, the Cloak of Shadows. Uh, but he doesn't have any other burn, so 
That's the issue, but I do think that Raz, just playing Raz, is a little bit more efficient, and then he can push a little bit of extra damage, force the threat on the board. Oh, wow. Okay. Squeezing it, just even one more ping instead of the other Keener's flow. Vlad starting things off with a center strike into a swindle, trying to draw more cards. Remember, the name of the game is to survive and set up a two-turn lethal if possible this turn. Wants to find deadly poisons, prep into a cutting class to draw deeper into the deck. Secret Passage is actually kind of huge here as well. Opportunity to draw deeper and potentially find huge combo damage. One, two, three, four, five cards have been played as well, so Prize Plunder very close to killing off Ra Raz Frost Whisperer just with the battle cry. Cool! That's huge. Okay. Okra is so important for the Mask of Cthulhu to not give. Rami, easy ways to get all that full damage would have to have the evolving missiles, which he happens to have. I, I think. Okay, never mind. Wow. Yes, he thinks he can do this. Uh, three weirdly enough, weirdly enough, I, I think the play was prize plunder, seeker passage to try and find the second deadly poison, because then you equip the deadly poison and he's at, uh, um. You push two more damage at 14, then the next turn you have six plus three, nine plus the Wicked Stab is, uh, is oh, that's only 13. Oh no, because the Paralytic Poison, that, that would have been exactly a two turn lethal setup, right? Um, if he had gone with that. Yeah, but- Maybe he was worried also, about dying because of all the cards, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly. The, the downside, okay. Rami drew like nine cards last turn and uh, fled Saw two in Candor's Flow. I think, if anything, if Rami played the third in Candor's Flow, he absolutely would have pulled the trigger on Cloak of Shadows, right? All the more reason to try to avoid a squeeze play from Rami to try to tightly fit a bunch of burn spells consecutively into the mix. Rami not finding Ring Toss here. He is very much afraid of what could potentially happen. Almost to the point where it might start to get to the territory if Rami survives this turn. He might have the deck of Lunacy and draw again, but he hasn't invested into it. And now, Fled has four, seven, plus the other four, 11. Uh, he doesn't have lethal, but Cloak of Shadows is what he's been setting up for. And I think Fled has picked the right time because then he'll have the 10th mana for Wicked Stat to upgrade as well. The question is, how much? How does he want to sequence this, right? He could end up attacking and then playing Cloak of Shadows and then doing the secret passage, but he loses a little bit of damage on the swing of his weapon over two turns. Yeah. I think he has to uh, dump every all all the, these cards here, and then secret passage the next turn to try and find the the rest of the damage. But he's running out of damage. The oh, bottom man. of the deck is is not robust for Flood. He's got a deadly poison, a wand maker, a coerce, and a self sharpening sword. Self sharpening sword, completely useless. Coerce, unless Rami <laughs> somehow finds a way to play a taunt, which he's used to both both the Pexis blast, so very unlikely. Um, and the deadly poison is just two uh, two damage on a turn. Wandmaker could be a lot of things. I'm it's true. Okay. Okay. Deadly poison. The coerce is nice as well. Every life point might matter here. Yoink. Okay. Yoink, Yoink could be All damage. Right. Yeah. And for Rami, it's pretty much about survivability. It can very much feel like the damage equation is solved, having seen 20 or, you know, 25 cards or so of his opponent's deck. Ring Toss comes to the hand. Ring toss. That could be Massive huge. Massive pickup. He's to corrupt it. Massive Cthune. Ring Toss. Ring Toss finds. Ice Barrier. Counter spell. But that doesn't... Does that solve everything? Can stab yeah, and a strike deal have, nine? It doesn't have enough damage. No, no, no. Oh, hold on. How much life is Rami at right now? What uh, to do? 12? What to do? You're right. I was, thinking, to, yeah. we, I was thinking Wicked Stab, Sinister Strike, and Yoink for like 100 hero power to get past everything. I'm almost out of 
Oh no. He can ho he he needs to hope that there's no burn damage and uh There isn't. Yeah, but there's two fireballs and a mask in the deck. It's true, but there's also no card draw. Uh, yep. Hmm. But even then, he doesn't have lethal over two turns unless he gets Hunter Hero Power exactly from Yoink. Oh. Doesn't find any significant damage. I guess Shapeshift, the Druid Hero Power, is a nice halfway point. Keeps him a little bit more alive. So Fireball Ping is no longer a kill if he removes the Hmm. The opposing minion on the board, I believe it's Sage still. Netherwind portal from Rami. I thought it was counterspell, but it makes sense because the Yoink didn't activate the counterspell. Fled sees the disappointment. I give up. That's a concession. Out of time, I think Fled probably could have hung a little bit more in there. He he didn't, uh, so Rami didn't actually have the burn to follow it up. So there was still a little bit more Hearthstone to be played, but I just think that Fled ran out of time because he was just considering all his possibilities and couldn't find like the right equation to remove everything with the prize plunderer. Uh, you brought up a really good point, TJ, is that Fled also did have damage issues, assuming Rami could gain life or put things in the way at the very last second. If and it wasn't, you know, an ice barrier, there was other things that Rami could have had to potentially disrupt uh, to get to that point. But ice barrier, of course, silver bullet to prevent him from dying in that exact spot. Yeah, but you can see what it takes for Mage in order to get to that point. Um, uh, like how close that was despite double and counter split star. Like, you, most matchups, you, you never see a double and canister full mage even get close, right? Maybe Priest, if somehow mage can't fit in like all their burn in a single turn, a Priest has a chance to, to heal it back up. You could sometimes get to these weird breakpoint turns later on. Um, but that was still like a turn away or a ring toss away. It, Vled had lethal without any, any secrets on that last turn. Yep. So, um, pretty, uh, uh, pretty big deal. And... Now Rami gets to go to Miracle Rogue. <sighs> Fled has some good matchups uh, uh, versus Miracle Rogue, but even if it's three good matchups, beating it three times in a row is incredibly unlikely. Uh, Weapon Rogue, I think, is okay, um, though Colt Neophyte makes it very difficult. Uh, and the Rush Warrior is a good matchup. And OTK Demon Hunter, again, is okay, but the Cold Neophyte makes it difficult. So, Rami's still in an incredible position. Yeah, uh, so if you even look at the data, uh, it's heavily skewed in favor of Miracle Rogue over the Weapon Rogue. Uh, it, it's a 15 to 6 favorite, aka a cut above 70%, TJ. That makes it a very polarized matchup. So Fled, even if things look really good, in the hands of a, of a skilled do. player with <laughs> cult neophytes, as you mentioned, or even just good setups, Miracle Rogue is very favored historically in Grandmasters against Poison, which is why you can't always just trust the data that you see on ladder. Especially because in ladder, you have the ability to mask. There's an element of mystery, right? You mask what kind of deck you're playing. You queue up into a rogue. A lot of people probably assume that it's the Miracle Rogue. And then all of a sudden you whip out the poisons and the weapons and it might be a little bit too late. The mulligan was wrong or they're not appropriating the resources correctly. And so in a tournament environment where deck lists are open like that, it changes the dynamic considerably. And I think the data reflects that too, right? Because as you go from uh, lower ranks, it's very favored for the weapon rogue. And then as you start climbing across the ranks, it gets more and more uh, even. And then in highest ranks in Grandmasters here, uh, pretty Miracle Rogue favored. Yeah. Oh. We might be able to get to see why that is, TJ. Look at this. Colt Neophyte discount to one. Wand Thief. Prize Plunder Vanessa Van Cleef. There's one thing that the Rogue deck struggles with the most. The Weapon Rogue, rather, struggles with the most, TJ, and that's wide boards. 
it's very difficult to deal with multiple targets at the same time because you're, everything about you is a single target um, for the most part. Like, unless you're able to generate something. This is too much pressure. This this might be yeah. already game over for Fled. This might be the fastest 3 0 we've seen all season in the semifinal. This is rough. This is really brutal. Is it even to the point where playing something like Wandmaker is wrong because you know of the threat of Octobot? This is something that, to even consider, right? Like, should you just not be playing those cards because you know the yeah, threat you can't of what Miracle to not play do? it though, because you, you need that damage, right? Uh, I, I don't know. Sometimes they just get you. And, I mean, Flood can hope that Rami is just kind of out of stuff. I mean, this isn't a terrible hand. There's a weapon. There's a weapon. There is card draw. There is secret passage. And we've seen the weapon rogue count to 30 quicker than almost any other deck out there. The relief poison as well. And with this about attack, getting rid of the cold neophyte. Yeah. With this attack already has signified what his game plan is. I just gotta raise some. Three damage this turn, four next turn, five, you six, seven. That's still not enough. That doesn't count the 30 in my book. Rami finds damage as well. And Shadow Step is available for Rami. Shadow Step on the Cold Neophyte. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> it just shuts off Fled's entire turn. Fled is dead. Yeah, Fled. Yeah, I mean, this was a, just a super <laughs> one-sided. <laughs> <laughs> like, this was just, oh, man. Uh, I, I feel for Fled because he had one close game, right? Um, it was a double in Clanner's Flow Mage. Most most of the time, that's not a close game, but he was playing Weapon Rogue, so it was. And then just two games where, honestly, it probably just felt like he couldn't do much. It does seem to be where things are pointing at right now. And, uh, you know, more importantly, Rami has shown very strong uh, matchup recognition of what he needs to be doing. He had situations where I think it'd be easy to get baited into certain lines, right? Which even going back to the deck of Lunacy. But, you know, really understands well how to win with this Miracle Rogue against a Weapon Rogue and Fled. Could just die this turn. Seven, eight damage on the board. Wand Thief could just find Fireball. And that could be all she wrote. Rami could also go for card draw with the field contact, try to go for a guarantee. <laughs> He's gonna draw and make sure that there's a wide enough board to where he can threaten. Evocation's actually a pretty big pickup too. Oh my gosh, another cold neophyte because uh, Rami's assume, the only way that Flood lives here is Cloak of Shadows. So Evocation means that he can get like Counterspell or uh, Ice Barrier, the Disruption Secrets to really make sure that that Fled uh, can't win the game over like some kind of miracle double Cloak of Shadows uh, sequence. Right now, Blood, while well, he yeah, has Secret Passage, doesn't even have uh, the Cloak of Shadows. We need to pick it up right now and maybe even like a Sinister Strike to go with it. Okay. If there's. Okay, Deadly Poison oh. and Cloak of Shadows. Okay. That's 18 damage. Over two turns. Are very close. Over two turns. Can he pull this around? Rami has. Ways to, to try and fight it back against this. The Cult Neophyte, for example. I'm not sure what Evocation could do. Secrets, perhaps. Uh, Ice Barrier, yep. Ice Barrier Counterspell. Um, Kazakis could get Lifesteal Taunt. Okay, Evocation looking for none of those. Nothing. Actually, funny Man. enough... Uh, he might end up wanting to use things like the Shooting Star to clear up board space so he can play other things. Yeah. 
So, Fled has oh 11 God. damage for one mana in hand. And a Swindle has two draws, three to find just a little bit of extra damage. Oh, no Colt Neophyte. I mean, if this pumps, finds the Tenwu. Tenwu gives. Oh, he can Shadow Step Vanessa Van Cleave and get back the Cloak, oh, of, cloak shadows. of Shadows. No oh, he can do it twice. No, he cannot actually. Because he doesn't have the mana to. Because Cloak of Shadows cost three. Wow, big turnaround from Rami. Fled needs to find the other still Cloak of over. Shadows now. Yep, still not over. Oh, he wait, also... no, Rami has a mask in hand. Oh, because my. Because Gosh, you're right. The mask stays. The Evocation Secret Passage. He gets the mask. Secret Passage. What a dynamic duo. Secret Passage and Evocation, a combo that many streamers love because of the wacky moments that creates and ends up being such a powerful two-card combination to lock Rami in. Fled, in his mind, doesn't know about that Mask of Cthulhu. He's going to try to draw, but I, you know, I do not know any sequence of cards available to Fled in any realm of possibility, even if he got to select the exact cards off of Discovers and Generation. He does find the Cloak of Shadows, and in his mind, that's an opportunity for him to survive, but he does not have a way to stop the Mask of Cthulhu, and with that, Rami is going to win 3-0, sweeping Fled and booking a spot in the Grand Finals of the first season here in 2021. Well played. Need to get the last opportunity to play this card, and that will do it. 3-0. At the end there, to go for the secret passage into uh, Vanessa Van Cleef, understanding what his outs were in that situation, what's the most likely to win. He could have gone for something like Kazakis, get a one-mana Golem, um, and like tried to hit like Lifesteal or Taunt or something to just buy a little more time. But uh, you could tell, as, as soon as he realized it, he Secret Passage, as soon as he saw Vanessa Van Cleef, he knew that that game was essentially locked because of the mask that he was able to shuffle back, or sh shuffle into his hand, essentially, uh, with the, uh, the Secret Passage and Evocation. So great job by, by Rami. <laughs> yes, he had some good draws, but good draws is often not enough, and he, he had the, the, the good play to back it up, so going to the finals. Great job, Rami. Excellent recognition. You know, I was like thinking about Cult Neophyte in the hand, but Rami was playing with his deck, not just with 